Welcome back to the 18th Nigeria Economic Summit holding in the Trasco Hilton Hotel in Abuja, Nigeria, where we're having a dialogue with respect to the regulation, cost of governance, and Nigeria's economic prospects. I'll bring in now Frank Igogo to ask the next question. Mr. Vice President, um, we had hoped that we would have um, the Senate leader um, at this uh, dialogue, uh, but um, unfortunately is not here, and as you have alluded, and some others have alluded, uh, this is a work not just for the executive arm of government, but something, in my view, that is collaborative and, and, and um, collective. I wanted to just get us into one of the uh, 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 areas of the teams of this conference, which is the cost of governance. Um, not too long ago, um, the government received three critical reports, uh, be they as they are all in the area of um, oil and gas. The report of um, Dr. Edi Kakalu uh, on the refineries, the Dotun Sulaiman report on governance issues in the National Oil Corporation, and of course the um, final report, which is the uh, report that was done by the team led by Ribadu. And I wanted to ask, sir, um, especially in the view that we see that we are only marginally able to reduce recurrent expenditure in favor of capital expenditure, which means that there is something more fundamental that we have to do. Um, so I, I ask you, uh, isn't it possible for government uh, to expedite action uh, on the implementation of this report? Because as we heard, the time is ticking. Every day we lose a day out of the time that we have allotted to ourselves to get to be the 20th largest economy uh, in the world. Thank you very much. You see, by, by having that report completed and submitted, it's a long way of achievement. And uh, just like the coordinating minister has explained on the other reports to do with the investigations, you see, to, to, to go in details and, the, and be assured of happenstances in uh, claims of corruption and what have you, one needs to be really uh, checked in details, like you need the forensic services of specialists, you need to go in detail to ensure that you get the right thing. You know, the, the, the most important thing is to be able to use this report to achieve our objective of stopping corruption and improving in governance, providing good, good governance to our people. So therefore, uh, uh, we, we, we should, you know, take the right step and take the right decisions to arrive, you know, at the correct position to handle these issues. But when we talk about, you know, uh, a reduction in government, there are other avenues. It's, on, it's not only that report. Take, for example, the privatization of the power sector. What that means, what that means is that from now on, all the expenditure that is needed to go into generation in this country will be provided by the private sector. All the resources that are needed to improve the integrity of our distribution system in the country, to expand and create new ones, is the responsibility of the private sector. So, which means that billions of dollars that are needed to be invested in that sector is now the responsibility of the private sector. And then again, we are putting, you know, in our focus, the issue of public-private partnership in providing infrastructure and other developmental uh, physical uh, uh, requirements in this country. You take, for example, in Malaysia, Indonesia, where billions of dollars are spent, 70% of the infrastructural works are being developed under PPP, and it's the private sector, therefore, that is investing. So we are going into that direction. As I speak, the second Niger Bridge is a PPP project. 
which is a major economic and important project in this country. And when I talk about the, the railway expansion, we have done the initial rehabilitation and taken steps on some few lines. But I can confirm to you here that there are private companies now that are looking through the public-private partnership to build fast train rail lines to connect Lagos and Abuja. And also, you see, the, like the ports, when I talk about the new deep sea ports, the private sector are coming in. So it's not only one, you know, avenue. Yeah, but as yeah. I, see, what, I, what I was hoping, Mr. Vice President, is that yeah. the Idika Kalum report, for instance, recommends the sale of or privatization of the, the refineries in 18 months. Currently, government is considering expanding $1.6 billion to overhaul the refineries. That's a lot of money that government can use to do something else. So that's the question. So why don't we apply the answer to NEPA uh, thank to you. the refineries and very speedily too? No, you said government is considering. Yes. So it's, it's considering both options. So a decision is to be reached at finally. Government is considering the issue of privatizing or the issue of, you know, taking it directly. It, it depends on the final decision. This is why I say uh, experts are looking at this thing, looking at the pros and cons and, you know, the advantages and disadvantages. And I can assure you, at the final analysis, we will take the right decision. With respect to um, the civil service and yes. efficiency there, I think there's also see, expectations yes, the for... the Orasanyo report is all part of the reform program of this administration, where you have duplication of right. government agencies. Right. And uh, 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 this committee was set up by government to advise on how do we reduce these expenses. And uh, we are in the right direction. The uh, recent year report has been submitted. You know, this, these are things also that if, if, if you are to implement the whole of our recent year report, it's not going to be in one year. It, this, this is something that will take time. And, you know, the important issue here is that certain positive action is being taken to address and reduce that duplication. First, the, um, so as not to mix things up. In terms of the cost of governance, I think the reports you're talking about identified areas where we can stem leakages and claw back resources for the government. As Mr. Vice President said, this is being looked at and we must, we must do the necessary. I think part of that is getting government out of business that it cannot handle. And we've set the pace. Mr. Vice President said it. If we can't handle it, let's admit as a government, there's nothing wrong with it. In mm -hmm. saying we've not been capable of delivering power, therefore we privatize. We've not been capable of delivering other services. So we go that route. I strongly believe that that is one way to kill many birds with one stone and reduce the cost, and that's what we should be doing. The second part of this is on the cost of governance, is on the expenditure side. And we, we have to be clear on both. On the expenditure side, you mentioned that we've reduced marginally. I love that. You know, when work is being done that is so difficult, it suddenly becomes marginal. We went from 77% in 2010 of recurrent costs, 10 percentage points down almost. Honorable Minister, you said it's yeah. difficult. What is the difficulty? No, Why hold on. I'm coming to it. Hold on. Because there's still room to do more. You Absolutely. know. The last time, we were, we were at 65 percent before I left government the last time. Came back, it's at 70 something. We've now, with the push of Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, we had, we've gone from 77 to 68.8. And we're driving down. That is not marginal. Now, let me tell you, there is room to do more. But you must recognize one thing. You come to a point where, even after we implement the Oron sign, which I think we, we, once we have the white paper, we should because there's certainly room to eliminate duplications and mm. you know, tighten uh, the spread of government, eliminate all these agencies, commissions, committees, some of them not really rendering any service. Mm. We are paying staff in certain agencies and companies and who are not rendering any service. But let me ask you one thing. These are human beings. The cost of personnel in the budget is 32%. Recurrent, it's huge. So when you get to a point when you're tackling the recurrent budget, when, when it means people, 
that's the bottom line. Let's just be frank about it. And, you know, it is the same public that says cost of governance. If you now say, okay, fine, let us now go. We had this you and cry about the misquoting of Lamido's uh, Sanusi. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, people almost went for his head. You have to understand that at the end of the day, when we talk about reducing cost of governance, we are ultimately talking about human beings. So it is the same government. Now, will you also come out and support that? People will say you're putting civil servants out. Each civil servant supports five or six people. You're in, in, the, in, in an economy where there's unemployment. You don't know what you're doing. So let us be frank with ourselves. Sometimes we talk in all these tones and contradictions, and we don't come out clearly. It has to be made clear that part of this cost of governance is that we've loaded people into the service. Right. And if we want to reduce cost of governance, we've got to do something so about that. Who is ready to support that? It's definitely a delicate That's the difficulty you're talking challenge about. Challenge here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Comprehensive feedback. Mm -hmm. Mr. Reynolds, thank do you, you have a, a point of view to share on this? Fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, mm. I just wanted to say something about the kind of political environment and the kind of the political smarts, if you like, of the of the reform program. And I very strongly agree what the uh, what the coordinating minister, minister of finance, has, has has said. If you're <laughs> to change the role of government in some of these sectors, it's very difficult to do without public uh, support. And if you're a person struggling to make 15,000 Naira a month, I don't think it would be too unfair to say that most people in that position have at least half a cynical eye on the reforms of government. And I believe that, of course, it's necessary to make the large-scale reforms, to make the macroeconomic reforms, to reform big sectors like electricity. But there's the other side of the coin. There's the reforms which are visible and practical and affect people's income at the lower levels. We're talking about 60 or 70 percent of the population who are, you know, struggling to try and make 15,000 naira a month and that type of thing. Uh, and there may be scope for the government to do more in this area of reforms alongside the larger scale reforms which are taking place, maybe. And, and my view is that the, the government should, should make at least uh, the same quantity of effort in implementing reforms which affect the poorer 60% or 70% of the population as it does on the larger scale you know, necessary reforms. The larger scale reforms are necessary but not sufficient. And I agree with my colleagues here about the question of the quality of supply of labor in Nigeria, sure. But there's a tendency for you know, economists and academics, some of them like me, to kind of say, you know, we've got, in one pigeonhole, we've got a demand side problem with labor. And on the other side, we've got a supply side problem with employability and this type of thing. But in practice, for the next decade at the very least, it's, it's not so co compartmentalized. Most of the employment will come from people who are currently operating to scrape a living somehow, selling a bit of this, doing a bit of work here and there, not very stable uh, uh, income. And, and to, to develop those at that level, the ability of those people to generate more income and, and, and not to see the development of small businesses as some sort of broad sweep thing you can do with donor support. I mean, it's a kind of root and branch reform, and my colleague here, I, I, I believe, supports right. um, this Mr. particular Reynolds. view. Frank, you have a question, because we need to begin to round up now. Well, I, I, um, I, I think the first point I'd like to make was just to say that the point that I'm making about cost, cutting cost of governance is not, I think there are many ways that you can work and work speedily to do this without direct heat on people, um, Minister, Minister. Um, but I, 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 I believe uh, also that um, Speeding up this process leads, in my view, to unlocking the potential of the private sector and indeed 
creating jobs as well. And I think um, uh, uh, Keith uh, 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 would like to um, you know, weigh in on that. I agree fundamentally. We, we did a survey in Manufacturers Association and only between two and five graduates out of a thousand is employable in a manufacturing environment at the moment. Now, this is where we come to the points that several speakers have made. It's about vocational training, equipping people to set up businesses that add value or to join existing businesses. It also takes to the, talks to the point about the humanity of the people in our infrastructure, civil servants, and the need to train them, particularly the younger ones, and, and, and develop them. And this is where um, we have a need to bring up that SME sector and allow people to provide employment. But so th I have two questions, if you like. One is, does that not question the policy of building a university in every state? Should we not be uh, revisiting the, um, the curricula and making them more relevant to Nigerians' needs now and fixing those and then before we start building more bricks and mortar. And then secondly, when it comes to those people coming out, whether they're retrained from the civil service, we need to get the financing right because still both the absolute interest rate and the availability of funding for these young people who have ideas that can generate uh, value and income at the moment, unless they've got a rich uncle, they're just not going to be able to kick off and start. The minister has a comment on that point. I think Keith's comments excited me because uh, I'll be very brief. I agree, but one, I mean, I want to say, Look, we are talking around this, the subject. If we are to change the skills set of the human, I really love what our colleague here had to say and uh, uh, my, my um, our co two colleagues at the end. We must have industry working with the education. That's what happens in other countries. We have so many vocational centers. That's not the point. If you go around the country, everybody is building a vocational training center. That's part of the you know, cutting the cost of governance. But what are we vocationally training for? Industry must get together with the education, with government, in order to determine this is where manufacturing is going, this is where this is going, and therefore this is what we need you to train for. Basic skills plus these technical skills. So we need to change the paradigm completely, in, in, in my view. Second, the second point I wanted to make is that government is actually trying to do some exciting things in this area. Quite apart from the longer term things of trying to diversify, and I want to mention the housing sector, where the president held a one day retreat, we've not mentioned it. Housing and construction is one of the sectors known all over the world to be very job creating. And the president has op is opening up, we're trying to build a, a, a new mortgage refinance facility with a liquidity facility really kick off mortgages in the country and bring them to affordable interest rates, support the sector, deal with the issue of land titling that was talked about and foreclosure. So that's one. But in addition, directly, the government is supporting entrepreneurship. And the reason I got excited is that it's not just about jobs, employers. It's about young entrepreneurs opening their own businesses. And the government has this program, which is really working, that you've heard about, you win. We are right now doing a survey of actual jobs, not estimates of jobs. We are going from entrepreneur. We've only disbursed one tranche. We've surveyed half the people. And so far, they've created 6,000 real jobs. We've surveyed about 600 of them. They've created 6,000 jobs, small jobs, from three to five employees, 10 to 12 that we're doing. So that to me is very, very encouraging. And definitely. I think government ought to do more of that. Absolutely, it's definitely good to hear the, um, about progress in that respect. But I want to come back to you, Mr. Vice President, with respect to Nigeria's agri policy. Um, how do we feed the nation going forward? Um, clearly, it's a key part of the transform transformation agenda of the current administration. 
But can you just share your thoughts on where we're going with this? You know, uh, you mentioned a lot. Yes, I know you uh, but you see, the, the issue, as I said, you see, agriculture uh, is the sector today that has the highest GDP in the country. And, uh, but when you compare our position in agriculture, is that we have not grown anywhere to achieve our food security need and the economics of agricultural development in Nigeria. And this is based on the fact that a lot has not been done correctly. Number one, if you look at our previous direction, was that we look at agriculture as a program. And for the last 30 to 40 years, this is the direction we have been going. And after 30 or 40 years, we have not achieved growth. <coughs> Taking the example of production per hectare, we expect that if you have a program that, uh, that is to support in improving agricultural production, you will grow in 30 years from where you are to somewhere better. But up till now, we are at about one, uh, one or 1 1.5 hectares, I mean, tons per hectare of land. While in our neighboring countries, even in Benin Republic here, farmers are producing eight tons per hectare. And we can go in above, above that. The, the, it is possible to grow up to 10 to 15 tons per hectare of land. So why is that happening? And uh, with the coming in of our new Minister of Agriculture, a program has been developed. We are now, we are stopping at looking at agriculture as a program, but looking at agriculture as a business. And you look at agriculture as a business, now we now have to look at all the value chain. So, so, and I said, in this direction, there are a lot that has been put in place. The country has been put into different, uh, addressing different sectors. You talk about cotton, you talk about all the cash crops, cocoa, palm oil, palm kernel, you talk about food crops, etc. Uh, uh, taking into from the farm production up to processing, uh, up to delivery, even at the shops, you know. So this is part of it. But the critical aspect is that also government has the responsibility of supporting the enabling environment for the farmer, farmers and the private sector to be able to come and contribute. And that is by putting the infrastructure like the irrigation schemes, the dams, the power supply, etc. Even the power we are talking about and the irrigation are all planned to be on the basis of public-private partnership with the private sector. So really, this is the direction. And uh, I believe there will be more detail this afternoon that right. will be given we by the We look forward to, to getting more of that detail. Yes. I really have to wrap, and I would really like for you to have the final word on this. Um, to just, f if you can, we've seen some presentations today about Vision 2020 and where we're going. Um, there have been some um, presentations saying that we may be lacking behind. Some of us are suggesting that we are still on track. Can you just summarize for us the vision of this government with respect to where you are taking this economy in the short to medium term. Thank you very much. You see, the vision of this uh, administration is under our transformation agenda. Mr. President has planned an agenda that as a plan by the year 2020, Nigeria should be among the 20 most developed countries. So the, the way uh, we have seen and the direction we are going we are going towards that positive direction. It has been said our GDP growth is good, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, Professor Noren said it is the envy of the, of the West today, the way we are growing. Uh, our foreign reserve 
has increased from 32 billion in two years. Now we are at $45 billion. We have established the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Our excess crude account has increased from $4 billion last year to over $9 billion today. Uh, generally, we are going in the right direction for our economic development. And the final analysis, of course, the Director General of the Summit have mentioned that based on his own criteria, that by year 2020, it is likely that we will be the 27th nation. But if we take certain actions, like the type of action we are taking and in ensuring that we implement, we will be able to meet that target of, among, of being among the 20 nations. But only uh, a few days ago, during the, our Honorary International Investor Council in London, the, uh, Mr. Jim O'Neill, who is the chairman uh, in the Goldman Sachs uh, property management, his own analysis have shown that if we go in with this right direction we are going, it is possible for us to be among the 20 most developed nations even before year 2020, by, by year 2017. So, so you see, this, this the, the, generally what that means is that we should keep focus, go ahead with the direction of the transformation agenda, and with that, I can assure you that we will achieve our objective of developing our economy to one of the best in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, let's leave it on that. Very optimistic note about the prospect for Nigeria's economy. We are what, you've been watching CNBC Africa special coverage of the 18th Nigeria Economic Summit holding in Abuja, Nigeria. I will leave it there. And until next time, it's goodbye.